attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. I just want to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? Hopefully you can. If you can't, just uh, type in the chat window and let me know. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Um, my name is Lucas Crossley. I am the Sales and Service Manager with Stahl's Digital Media Supply. And uh, this is my first webinar, so please go easy on me. <laughs> um, today we're going to uh, take a look at uh, the Roland BN20 Versa Studio. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do with it. And uh, we're going to take a quick look at ROI as well with this unit. Um, when I was initially uh, asked to do this webinar, I really had to think about this because I think there's so many topics here. We, we could almost do a, a webinar on, on a lot of these separate topics. So this is kind of general in nature. Um, certainly there will be a Q&A session uh, afterwards, and if you do have questions as we're, as we're going along, feel free to type them in. I'll do my best to answer them. I don't mind uh, uh, answering questions as we go, uh, that way when it's still fresh in your, in your head. Um, so we're going to talk about the benefits of, uh, features and benefits of the, the BN20, um, um, and we're going to look specifically at uh, making heat transfers and making decals with this machine. That seems to be um, a really good uh, market for uh, this unit due to its size and the ease of operation. We're going to cover some of the materials that we have available for making heat transfers, and we're going to look at the process of making a heat transfer um, as well. For those of you who, who sort of aren't familiar with exactly how that looks, we're, we're going to take a quick look at that, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the sign-making side of this as well, because we use this machine for a lot more than just making uh, heat transfers. And we'll take a quick look also at pricing out uh, some of your jobs and some of the different things uh, that, uh, that we'll, we can do with this machine. Okay, so let's dive right in. So, for those of you who don't know, the Roland BN20 Versa Studio is, um, it's been around for about a year now, really popular machine. Uh, I think a, a, a good portion of the reason for its popularity is due to the size. It's a 20-inch desktop format uh, machine that you can actually place on a desktop. And it's, it's designed and purpose-built for uh, short-run uh, uh, decals and uh, heat transfers and some simple signage. Very, very simple and easy to operate, which is another thing that makes this unit uh, so appealing to a lot of people. It's, it's not as intimidating as some of the bigger machines. We have some options here for, uh, for our ink configurations as well. We can run this with a four-color uh, ink, which we would call cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. That's how most of our printers run. And we can create the vast majority of colors uh, using CMYK. But we also have the option of including a metallic silver ink cartridge. And that metallic silver ink actually blends with uh, the remaining colors, and you can print up to uh, 512 different metallic and pearlescent colors, which is really cool. If you do any custom graphics and custom artwork at all, uh, that's something that you can utilize to really set yourself apart from what some of the other competitors who are still running older four-color machines uh, are able to do. And there's a white ink option, too. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these later on, but that white ink option is great for, for making labels and doing window graphics, things like that. Uh, Another thing that makes the BN really popular is that we have integrated print and cut uh, in, one, in one unit, so um, that saves us a lot of time and a lot of effort. And Roland has simplified the cutting mechanism and uh, the motors in this, in this unit. There's no, no need to adjust an offset like you would have in a standard cutter. It's very simple to use. Uh, another point that I'd like to make is that we have an automated ink circulation system in the BN20. Roland's kind of something that Roland has come out with. You may see my, my mouse here on the screen, and you'll see this particular machine has a metallic ink cartridge in it. Metallic ink and white ink uh, is a little trickier to work with than your standard CMYK. It has some solvents in it and, uh, that, that can settle if they're left uh, to sit over time. So what Roland's done to counter that is they put a circulation system in their ink line. So this is another pump here, and what it actually does is it circulates metallic and or white, depending on the machine you have throughout the system to prevent that settling from happening. And that, that's a unique design to Roland. If you look at some other manufacturers out there that are doing are now doing uh, metallic and, and white ink, a, a lot of those systems don't, don't have that circulation. That's pretty important in keeping your, your maintenance down. Uh, so that's a good thing to look for. Another really cool feature that Roland came out with when they launched the VS series was what they call Roland On Support, and I'm a big fan of this. I like to do a lot of my printing and cutting jobs without actually being anywhere near the printer. Obviously, we all have businesses to run, and 
our time is better spent, you know, dealing with our customers and making sure they're happy than standing there watching a print. So what Roland On Support does is it's a separate software that will actually monitor the printer and uh, it will send you email alerts or text messages regarding the status of your jobs and where you're at. So it's kind of gives a little bit of peace of mind knowing that the job printed off and, and it's all done. You don't have to worry about whether or not there was a head strike or some other issue. And of course we have a one year uh, warranty on the Roland BN as well. With the, the BN, um, we have a, a, a new print head that Bowen brought out. This came out with uh, the VS series. It was the first time this print head was seen. This print head is unique to Roland. They actually manufacture this print head. No one else has this. So it's, it's a fairly significant improvement over uh, the older uh, SPI series or the older VersaCams that were out there on the market. Uh, those machines used an Epson print head, and that's a great print head, really reliable, did a great job, but this is an improvement over that. What they've done here is the machine now has one print head with eight channels in it, and depending on the, uh, whether you're looking at a VS or a BN or something like that, that will change how the, uh, how the ink is actually um, delivered through the system. But we've actually been able to increase our print speed and, and improve our print quality with this new head. With the older Epson style print heads, they had uh, what's called variable droplet technology. Without getting too technical, what that means is that as this print head moves back and forth across the platen, and it's putting ink down onto the page, we can actually vary the droplet size, the individual droplet size of the ink. And, and in the older design, there was three different droplet sizes available. The new head has seven droplet sizes available. So it's a pretty significant improvement. What that means is that you're going to see uh, much better gradients uh, when, you're, when you're printing gradients, you're going to see a much better result and much better ink density when you're printing solid colors. Um, we've also eliminated something called chromatic banding. If you're ever out, I do this all the time, if I'm ever out and, I, and I'm looking at printed graphics, I look for what's called banding. If you take a look at stuff, you're, you're eventually going to see it. It's literally um, bands of, of, of interruption in the solid color and it could be a calibration error or it could be some other reason for that. Uh, but they've done away with it on these units. I've actually never seen it on a VS unit or a BN unit that's using this print head. So the print quality is really improved. And another thing that's interesting too is that they've gold plated this, this, uh, this print head. On previous designs and really on any inkjet printer, large format inkjet printer, uh, static electricity can be a real problem in terms of maintenance. Um, it may not show itself early on uh, in, your, in your operation, but eventually the static will cause a problem. And the reason for that is if you can imagine this print head, you know, moving back and forth across the page and dropping ink onto the page, it's such a fine action that you can't even see it with your eye, you can't see it happening. So if you have static electricity going on between the print head and the paper uh, going across the printer, it will create a misting effect where the ink is not only getting on the page, but it's now misting and, 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 and it's almost like a fog inside the printer. And you'll see this on certain printers if you take a look at them, any, any plastic parts that are white or things like that, they'll start to discolor. In often cases, they'll, they'll go a cyan type color and that as a as a technician, as a rolling technician, that's a, a surefire sign that we have a static electricity problem. And as I said, that in and of itself doesn't seem so bad, but it can affect your print quality and it will cause you some maintenance issues down the line, particularly something like a linear encoder scale or something like that will we'll start to malfunction due to this ink building up on the machine. So this new gold plated head uh, reduces the static and prevents clogging and, and, and really minimizes the amount of maintenance that you have to do. And while I'm talking about maintenance, I'm just going to kind of quickly say that the, the manufacturer's recommended cleaning process for this, uh, this machine is, is once every two weeks. And that's a manual cleaning, and it only takes about five minutes to do. We can talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. And finally, uh, another improvement to the uh, image quality is something that's called Roland Intelligent Pass Control. Uh, it creates smoother gradations and rich density and, and a lot deeper saturation in your, in your print. So when you're doing photorealistic printing, or some high resolution stuff that you really want to pop, you can get some really fantastic results with this new print head. So just remember when you're looking out, and you're doing for shopping, this is a Roland print head, nobody else has this. And it's interesting that Roland actually manufactures their own, their own head. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the Roland BN20, as do the VS series, they also offer um, some, some different ink choices for you, some different options for you in how you want to configure this machine. And the first thing I wanted to touch on was, was the Roland EcoSol Max inks. 
you'll hear a lot of manufacturers out there talking about their printers using EcoSol Max ink. Well, EcoSol ink is actually a brand name. That is Roland specific. So if someone else is telling you they're using EcoSol ink, it's, it's not entirely true. It may mean they're using a mild solvent ink, but they're not using Roland inks. These are specifically manufactured um, for, for Roland machines. So with the BN20, we have four different options that we can choose from as to how we want to run the machine. The most common option is uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Okay? The BN20 uses five ink cartridges, so we get an extra magenta. And this is really... Uh, this is the recommendation that I tend to make for most people. The reason for that is that um, most, most of our customers are making heat transfers and decals and things like that, are typically not designing the graphics from the ground up. They're typically taking another person's file, you know, putting a cut line in it, printing it, and then putting it on a garment. So that original file that your customer is going to give you was already created in CMYK. So, so having a metallic ink cartridge there doesn't really benefit you because you're not necessarily going to use it. However, for uh, custom graphics shops who are doing design from the ground up, this metallic option makes a lot of sense. So if you take a look at this image on the top right-hand side of your screen here, you'll see we have this metallic silver going on here, and we have a metallic gold going on in this label. It's a really cool effect. Uh, it looks fantastic. Uh, so again, we're mixing metallic silver with you know, some other colors to create the gold. And the 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 conversation that I always have with end users who are considering this is, is again, making sure that, you know, we're doing some custom design work. We're actually sitting across the table from a client saying, hey, you know, what do we want this, this honey label to look like? And you're actually designing it from the ground up. That is the best opportunity to take advantage of the metallic inks. And you really need to have your design uh, skills in order to properly take advantage of using metallic ink as well. So, I'm not trying to dissuade anyone from choosing it. I'm trying to make sure that if you choose it, you're doing it uh, uh, well informed. I've seen some folks in the past, you know, jump on the metallic and then realize there's a little bit more to it than maybe they thought. For example, if you're looking at this logo, if I was going to print this word honey in this gold, uh, gold metallic color, I actually have to knock out each of the letters from the black background in order for it to still be gold. Otherwise, if I print the gold ink on top of the black ink, it's going to change the color and it's no longer going to be gold. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of a simplification, um, but if you can imagine what that would look like in Corel Draw or Illustrator, you can see that there's a little bit more work involved in getting that, uh, in getting that result. But I think the result speaks for itself. It's really worth it. The third configuration option I wanted to talk to you about is our, our white ink option. You can kind of see that in this, uh, in this image down here on the, on the bottom of the screen. What we've done here is we've printed on a clear, uh, a clear substrate, and we've backed the graphic with white ink in the areas where we really want it to pop. And this is ideal for, um, for window graphics particularly and for product labeling. You'll see that a lot in product labels as well. And it's a really cool effect. Again, the artwork requirements are a little bit more stringent. Again, you kind of have to, you kind of have to understand what you're doing with Corel or Illustrator uh, to take full advantage of it. But if you have, um, you know, if you have this in your market and it makes sense for you, then that's a great option to choose from. And finally, uh, the last option is an aqueous uh, ink option. I've sold an awful lot of BN20s, and I've yet to have someone pick this. But the aqueous is a water-based ink for uh, for indoor uh, indoor graphics. And uh, so far, I don't know anyone that's that's chosen that. But again, you have a wealth of options available to you. A really important uh, uh, note about this, and and why I'm sort of spending so much time talking about each of the different choices, is that once you've chosen your configuration, there's no going back. So if you if you choose metallic silver. You know, and you decide at some point that, you know what, this probably really wasn't for me. There's, there's no reconfiguring the machine to no longer be using the metallic ink. So uh, that's why I'm trying to impart on you, you know, some of, the, um, some of the logic that goes into how you should choose your ink set, uh, because it is a very important decision to make. So another feature that, that's been around for a while now, and this is something that Roland uh, uh, started with their early Versicams, was integrated print and cut. Um, and it's pretty much a standard. Everybody's doing this now. Um, I think you'll find if you watch the if you watch the market closely uh, with printer manufacturers, you'll note that you know, Roland comes out with something, and, and, and inevitably, you know, um, other manufacturers are almost sort of waiting to see what Roland's going to do, and then, and then they come out with their own version. So I know back in the day there were other companies that were creating marketing documents and things, trying to refute integrated print and cut, and saying it's not the best way to operate. However, I mean. 
just looking at this workflow here makes it, it makes a lot of sense. So this was sort of an old style workflow where we would we would design our, our artwork and, and print it, and we were using a print only device. So we then had to take that print, unload it, um, put it in a separate cutter, align it, and register it, and then and then load it up and cut it. And obviously now it's print and cut. It, it's one integrated workflow, and, and it's much simpler and easier to do. It's a great feature and very handy and uh, indicative of all versicans. So now that we're talking about this a little bit, if we take a look at the heat transfer side of it, there's just so many different products that you can make. Um, this is just a snapshot of you know some of the items that are sort of maybe the most common things, things like totes and and, and t-shirts and hoodies and you know uh, hats and so forth. Uh, you know I've seen people do tents and awnings and cooler bags and you know, anything you can stick in a heat press you can you can pretty well decorate. Um, and, uh, and, and this is just on the heat transfer side of it. So we really ha haven't even sort of touched yet on the signage side of it. So for those of you who, who maybe aren't familiar with the process of making a heat transfer, maybe you've seen our CAD prints products and things like that, I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, process coming up. I'm not going to get too in-depth, but I'm going to kind of give you a rough idea of what it looks like. So if you're going to be making heat transfers, certainly you're going to need some form of an inkjet printer, um, uh, some heat transfer media, and we have lots of options available. Um, for you there. Heat transfer mask, I'm going to show you exactly what this is and how it works a little bit later on. I recommend an easy weeder. I'm, uh, I'm sort of assuming that most of you are familiar with the process of weeding, uh, but this, this easy weeder tool, I, it's funny when I go into sign shops, I've never seen one before. They, they get their hands on it and they love it. And a lot of them are using exacto knives to do their weeding. Um, a squeegee and or a laminator to apply the pre-mask to a transfer and obviously a heat, tra a heat press and some sort of uh, some sort of uh, substrate for decorating a t-shirt and so forth. So as I mentioned earlier, um, certainly Stalls has a lot of different options for you um, for, for decorating garments. Two of our most popular products that our VM20 users gravitate towards are uh, our Express Print here. It's a great, great product for cotton and poly uh, blends. It works great, low cost and simple to use. And then our Solutions Opaque product is fantastic for, uh, for uh, nylon and lycra and spandex and all these sorts of things. So, and we can decorate pretty much any substrate, um, nylon, spandex, cotton, lycra, poly, leather, uh, you name it, uh, you know, pretty much anything that will hit fit in a heat press can be decorated. One important note um, uh, is just regarding size. Keep in mind that the BN20 is 20 inches, so you're going to be looking for uh, media uh, that is, you know, 20 inches uh, or smaller. Uh, for those customers that we have that are purchasing BN20s that maybe want to try something that isn't in 20 inches, we do offer a slitting service here, so we can slit or roll down, and you can still uh, still try it out. When you order any of those types of material and you're getting ready to make your heat transfer, we provide these tech sheets. And tech sheets are just a great uh, one source spot for all the information regarding the product you're about to use. So uh, we even provide these in a little sample kit. So we send you out, you know, a little swatch. Maybe some of you've had these that you can, you know, you can heat apply a pre-made sample. So we tell you, you know, your time, your temperature, and your pressure on your Hotronics heat press. Um, and we also give you some basic uh, cutting recommendations as well. These are just a starting point, but we'll give you some idea of what your blade, what blade you should be using, what blade force you should be at, and your offset, and so forth. Um, again, the the standard recommendation here would be to do your own test cut. These are just a guideline, but uh, this is a great little tool to have. A lot of my customers will actually print these off and post them on the wall above their heat press, uh, just so that they have them handy. So it's a nice tool. These are all available for download for the different materials off of our website as well. Let me just show that. So the process is 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 pretty simple. Um, you know, either you're going to be designing a logo, um, you know, in Adobe Illustrator or Corel Draw or Photoshop, uh, and, or you're going to be taking your customer's logo and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be putting a cut path in that logo and then outputting it um, to what we call a RIP, and that that's, stands for Raster Image Processor, and that's the software that communicates um, sort of between your design and your printer. Um, I have some videos up on the Stalls DMS YouTube channel regarding uh, VersaWorks specifically, and in our post-webinar wrap-up, we'll, we'll provide those links, and you can watch those videos, and they will show you um, in a lot more detail than I have time for here some of the different things that you can do with Roland VersaWorks and how easy and simple it is to use. 
So once you've brought your file into VersaWorks, you're just going to lay it out. You'll print it and cut it, read it, mask it, and hit apply. And we're going to take a quick look at each of those steps uh, as we move forward. One of the things I wanted to talk about, this may be new information for some of you. Um, for others, it may be, it may be old information. Um, but I think it's a really relevant slide. Um, here we're going to take a look at the difference between vector and raster graphics. So vector graphics are definitely our preferred uh, graphic type. The reason why we like vector graphics, uh, if you think back to sort of you know uh, high school math, vectors are intersecting lines. The nice thing about an intersecting line is that you can make it as large as you want and it still uh, retains its image uh, uh, crispness and sharpness. It still looks really good no matter how big you make it. So if you're making a large decal maybe of your, your business and you want to put it on you know, the side of your vehicle, or your car, your truck, something like that, you, you probably want a vector graphic that you can pull up and make nice and big. The image that we have down here is a raster image. So these are going to be things like JPEGs, um, you know, TIFFs, um, GIFs, things like that. And they're made up of pixels. And so a pixel is, you know, a small square with some data in it. And um, the, the, the more pixels we have per inch, the, you know, the larger we can make the graphic and still retain some image quality. But at some point, you can see what's happening to this, this image. It's no longer crisp. It no longer looks nice. Um, and we call this pixelation. And we say the image looks pixelated. So when a customer calls you, and some of you might giggle here, but I'll just get my logo from the internet, um, this is probably what you're going to wind up with when you print it. Uh, and a second point, too, is that if we want a cut line in here, well, our cut path needs to be a vector path. So if I'm going to cut the, you know, the F out of this board, I need a way to put this, that vector line in there. I either have to draw it manually or use some kind of trace program or something like that. Well, if I use a trace program, the trace program is going to trace the pixels, and I'm going to wind up with a really jagged cut line. That's a very quick kind of crash course. Um, and I hope it's relevant information for, for at least some of you. It's, it's very, very good information to have. So since we're sort of talking about graphics and cut lines, I kind of want to show you what, uh, what a cut line will look like. So here we have two examples of a graph, one in CorelDRAW and the other in Adobe Illustrator. You can see in each example that I've separated a cut line to show you what this typically looks like. So over here we have Corel. And you can see we have this, this magenta looking line here. And then we have kind of the same thing in Adobe Illustrator. Um, this is, happens to be uh, not only a shameless plug of our logo, but also a vector graphic. So creating this cut line is, is fairly easy. Um, however, if this was a raster image, we might have to do a little bit more work to get that, to get that cut path. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, about colors, specific colors here in a minute as well. But Roland has actually created color palettes for us to use in both Illustrator and CorelDRAW. And one of the colors that are available in the palette is our cut contour color, what we call cut contour. And anything we draw as a vector line in either design uh, software will be recognized by the RIP, which is Roland VersaWorks, as a cut path. So when, when Roland VersaWorks sees this line, it knows not to print it. It knows that that's going to be the cut path where the blade's going to go and cut this logo out for us. So let's take a look uh, here at the color, one of the color palettes. So uh, this is a, a, the uh, color palette library from, uh, from Corel uh, X4, X4, I believe, actually. So anything prior to Corel X5 or Corel 15, we, we have to add the color palette uh, to Corel Draw or to, uh, to Illustrator. It's fairly simple to do, and I actually do have a video on the YouTube channel that shows you how to do this. It's quite simple. Once you do this, these colors are available. You'll notice this color that we have up here selected is called Cut Contour, and as long as it exists in the custom spot color palette, anything that we draw with it uh, will become our cut path. And it works much the same in, in, Corel, uh, sorry, in Adobe Illustrator. Corel 15 and above automatically includes the Role and VersaWorks color libraries. And those color libraries are really powerful tool, tools for color management. Uh, Roland is even now uh, uh, including uh, Pantone libraries as well. The benefit with, with th these color libraries is that you can print out <coughs> excuse me, color swatches that exist within Roland VersaWorks. So if a customer walks into your shop with a business card, for example, and they don't have a, they don't have a vector graphic and you have to create the graphic, you can, um, you, you can print the chart 
on the media that you're going to use to create uh, the design, let's say it's a logo on a vehicle, and then hold the business card up to it until you find the correct color, and then pick the color out of the, uh, the swatch library and do your fill uh, in uh, Illustrator or Corel, whatever it is you happen to be using. So it's a pretty powerful tool. So here we're looking at Adobe Illustrator. Um, I have to apologize. I'm, I'm a little behind in my versions. This is uh, CS3. I think we're up to CS6 now, but I'm, I'm working on it. Um, so back in, in this version, you can see here we have the, uh, the cut contour color uh, specified. We need a one-point stroke on our graphic in order for VersaWorks to be able to see it, and that's kind of what we're showing here. And then you can see the color palette here. I've got a couple of color palettes docked down here as well. And some metallic colors and white colors and a whole bunch of other uh, neat stuff in there too. And we have the same sort of thing here shown in uh, Corel Draw. And uh, down here I have my color palette open as well. And again, it's, it's a cut contour color and I believe it is a hairline, I believe is the minimum in Corel Draw. It's been a little while since I've done one. So we're going to take a quick, quick look at Roland VersaWorks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the software that uh, uh, that does a uh, communicates between our design software and our printer. Um, we could do easily do several presentations just on the software alone, so I'm going to kind of gloss over it, but it'll give you an idea of what it looks like and how it functions. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, if you take a look at the videos in the links that we provide later, you can get an in-depth look at at how VersaWorks functions and how easy it is to use. Uh, here we have actually two printers connected at the moment. We have two different input folders that we can automate, but we're grabbing our, our GMS logo here and uh, bringing it into the queue and, and getting it ready for output. Um, the acceptable file types are, are PostScript files, EPS files, um, JPEGs, TIFFs, uh, PDFs, and, and so on and so forth. Most folks will, will tend to use what's called an EPS workflow. So out of CorelDRAW, you export the file as an encapsulated PostScript or in Illustrator, you save it as an EPS file and uh, bring it in here and, and do the layout and so on. So this is the layout screen, um, actually the cut control screen for, uh, for uh, VersaWorks. And you can see we have this funky line going on here. This basically tells you we're in a cut only mode here. So cut only means if I was to send this job, we wouldn't print anything, we would just cut out these shapes. That's why I don't actually see the logo anymore, but I did this to illustrate that if you've done your cut line correctly in, in, in Adobe Illustrator or in CorelDRAW, you'll see this red marquee of lines moving around your logo, and these actually move. If you've gone through the steps of you know, putting in a cut contour color and so on and so forth, and you don't see the cut line there, uh, there's probably something wrong with your, with your, with your file. Uh, so this is just a quick slide to show you what it sort of looks like once you've done it correctly. And here um, is kind of the main screen for Roland VersaWorks. So uh, we can see we have a BN20 here, and we have a, a VS300. We've got a couple of different queues. We have some basic information about our machine, you know, even our, our logo, rather, even how much ink we're going to use to print it, and a low-resolution preview um, over here. Uh, it's very simple and, and easy to use software. Again, I can't dive into it too much, but um, I'm going to show you the quality tab. This is really important. One of the reasons why I wanted to show you this is because we uh, we have a lot of uh, what we call print profiles. And Roland is a bit unique that in that they bundle the Roland VersaWorks software with the printer, and they include print profiles. So uh, to explain to you what a print profile is, it, it's it's essentially uh, information that the printer uses to put down the right amount of ink, the correct heat. Uh, the correct feed calibration, and so on and so forth, to ensure that regardless of what kind of paper you're printing on, and you can see I've got a lot of options here in my list, I'm able to create the same color across a variety of different substrates. Your document printer that you use in your office, you know, that's the same kind of paper you put in there every day. It's the same thickness, it's the same white point, and nothing changes about it. But I could be going from, you know, a 13-ounce banner you know, to a, a two mil cast vinyl. They might have different white points, different abilities to absorb ink, and so on and so forth. So if I'm trying to print, you know, Pantone 285C on a variety of different substrates, I'm going to need something to tell the printer how to do that. And that's what a print profile is. 
they're created in a lab using a spectrophotometer uh, and, and you know, some specialized software and then obviously someone who knows how to use it. And they're really critical to maintaining and getting great color. And this is one of the things that a lot of potential uh, um, printer owners neglect to look at when they first buy a machine. They don't really take a good hard look at the software that runs it. And really this is the car or the engine that runs the car. You know, I can't imagine anybody would go out to uh, a car dealership and, and, you know, kick the tires but not open the hood. And, and that's what a lot of people do when they purchase a printer. They, they look at the, at the two pieces of hardware and they go, well, that one's, you know, $2,000 less, so I'm going to buy that one. And then later on, you know, they realize that if they want a print profile, they, they have to try to find one from the manufacturer of the material. And that can be challenging because print profiles, number one, are difficult to make, and they're time consuming to make, and they have to be made um, for every print mode and for every ink set. So if you can imagine with a BN20, we have four different ink configurations, right? We have our CMYK, we have our CMYK plus metallic, we have our CMYK plus white, and we have our aqueous based ink. So if I want to make a heat transfer profile, I'm going to highlight it on heat transfer here, for a Roland BN20, I need at least four profiles just to cover the basics. That doesn't include print modes. So I might have a print mode like standard, which is a high, or high speed billboard or high quality, each one of which will require its own print profile. So you can see I could have up to four print profiles per media type per print mode. You can see it really quickly becomes a laborious uh, job. Um, if a print profile doesn't exist, there may be a generic recommendation that gets you close. But if color is critical to your success, it's really important to have a print profile with the media. So when you buy a Roland, you get all these print profiles when you do your first software update. They're free, they don't cost anything, and they allow you to seamlessly print from one type of media to another. When you get your role of GCVP, it says GCVP on the roll. You come to this list, you pick GCVP, and you forget about it. For the most part, you don't have to worry about it. If you go with other manufacturers, you're not likely to get that benefit. So that's just something I wanted to point out because it's really, really important. And while we're on the topic of RIP software, uh, you know, if you are shopping for a large format printer or, or something like the BN20, make sure you get a full demonstration of the RIP. You know, uh, it's critical, and a lot of rips out there, uh, there's some great products, you know, FlexiSign, Onyx, Wasatch, and so forth. They're fantastic products, but they cost an awful lot of money, and a lot of them require a USB dongle key in order to operate them, and they may be more than what you really need, um, uh, which is what's nice about VersaWorks. It doesn't require a USB dongle key. It comes on a DVD, and you can install it on every computer you have in your shop, and the ones you have at home, too, if you want. Your updates are free. We act... A that launches out to roll on server and pulls down the latest data. There's no charge. There's never any issue with that. So it's really powerful, and I highly recommend that if you're shopping, you take a good hard look at that. A lot of folks don't, and they typically wind up sort of regretting it later. So um, moving on, we've gone into the screen, into the layout screen. It's very simple. Uh, the printer communicates with uh, uh, with the software. So if you put in a 30-inch roll of media, in the case of a VS300, you just click Get Media With, and it'll automatically know that there's 30 inches available there. You say, I want to print 50 copies. You press 50 in. You hit Enter. Boom. It lays out your 50 copies ready to go. Very simple, very intuitive. Um, and, you know, no, no fuss, no muss. Most people who are operating CorelDRAW and Illustrator, uh, they, they typically take about two hours to learn how to operate this software. And when we're doing our installations and training, um, part of the requirement is that you as an end user will be operating the software by yourself before you leave, before we leave, rather. So, so that, that's kind of critical. And when you're buying, investing in equipment, you, you know, a long learning curve is, is, is not always beneficial, right? You want to get back to running your business and, and, uh, and doing that as quickly as possible. So here we've, we've laid out our job. We're going to do 30 copies. Um, there's our total print area and, uh, and our ink consumption that we're using, the name and location of our file, and so on. Very simple. In the next screen, you can see this is our sort of our layout. We have all these options here where we can rotate and flip things around. Um, we can mirror something. We can put crop marks on here. Uh, I'm not going to go through, obviously, all of these, but I just kind of wanted to give you a crash course. As I said, the videos that you see later on are much more in-depth. They're about 10 minutes long each, but I highly recommend you watch them because I think you'll be impressed with the software. So now we would be at the printing stage. We've, 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 we've put our cut line in our transfer, and uh, we've brought in the software and laid it out, and we press print to make our 30 copies. So in the next slide, um, 
I'm sure most of you have kind of probably already seen this sort of thing, but um, we kind of have a snapshot here of the VN20 printing uh, logo here on our express print. And then literally as soon as we're done printing, the knife comes out and contour cuts around the logo for us. So we're, we're ready to go on to the next step. Once we've done the printing and cutting, we're going to do the old favorite, which is weeding. I know everyone out there loves doing this. It's my favorite thing in the world, too. <laughs> a little bit of sarcasm there. I'm sure you can pick that up. So on the top left screen here, uh, we are we printed a heat transfer product, and we're just weeding the excess material away uh, from uh, from that. And on the lower left of the screen here, I just wanted to show a close-up shot of that weeder tool. It's a little bit like a like a dental pick. And I do laugh when I go into sign shops because a lot of sign shops have never heard of these things and they just love it. You got to grab all these little cavities out of this letter A here. This thing is really, really handy for doing that. So we do our weeding and our uh, uh, and everything like that, and then we move on to the masking process. So the purpose of of masking is to allow us to remove the heat transfer from the carrier. <clears throat> Excuse me. Heat transfers have uh, a heat activated adhesive and a lot of these heat transfer products are really, really thin. Um, and uh, if you were to try to you know, pull that heat transfer off the backing paper without any mask, it'll just roll up in your hand and you won't be able to use it. Solutions Opaque is a great example of that. Um, so what we do is we apply this mask and we, we can either do it by hand using a squeegee as you can see they, they've done here or using a laminator. We do bundle the uh, the, the, the twenty inch can or twenty inch BN twenty with a small laminator. It's, it's kind of purpose built for this this reason. The other benefit is that if we are making decals or sign related material that we want to have them go outside or we want them to be scratch resistant, we apply an overlaminate film to them to help increase their durability. So here we're 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 hand masking, um, and this is how you know when I started making heat transfers you know, seven years ago or or thereabouts, I was hand masking a lot of them. There's a couple of different ways to do this, um, but doing this from the center out, like you see here in this image, is a, is a great way to do it. So you're going to cut a piece of uh, a pre-mask just slightly larger than the transfers. And uh, as I said, if you look at that image on the top left of your screen, you'll see that we're applying the mask from the center of the page and then moving out. Um, it's, it's also best, in this case, you're going to want to use a squeegee. So as you put the center down, you take your other hand with a squeegee and you know, work your way this way and then work your way this way, trying to remove air bubbles um, as you're going along. If you do happen to get an air bubble uh, uh, between your, uh, when you're applying your pre-mask, a lot of times you can get rid of that when you do your second heat application. But this is, again, one of the reasons why, uh, personally, I prefer the laminator. Um, there's a lot less wastage and a lot less, um, a few, much fewer errors when using the laminator than there is by hand masking. Mind you, some people are really good at hand masking, so uh, I don't happen to be, though. <laughs> so once we've applied the mask, you can see here we're now, we're now using this mask to pick the uh, heat transfer up off the carrier. And that's why we call it a transfer, because we're lifting it up off the carrier and we're going to transfer it to the garment. So now that we've, we've got that graphic on the mask and it's a clear mask, we're ready to do the heat application. And we can refer back to the text sheet that we looked at earlier uh, so that we know what our time, temperature, and pressure uh, needs to be when we're doing this. Um, one, one thing that's really important, most of you folks probably are already aware of this, but we, we always recommend that we preheat any garment according to the application instructions on the text, the text sheet. Preheating the garment ensures that any moisture that's contained within the garment is removed. And I've found this to be particularly important when you're using substrates like cotton. Cotton can hold a lot of moisture. I've even had steam come off the heat press when I'm preheating before. So you can imagine if you were to have skipped the preheat and gone right to the heat application, if that steam is hitting the back of the heat activated adhesive on the heat transfer, it probably is going to negatively affect how that heat transfer is going to bond. So we always recommend to preheat, usually about 10 seconds or so. Um, so once we've done the preheat, we're going to align the transfer uh, onto uh, the garment, make sure we use a cover sheet, and then do the heat application uh, as per the instructions on the text sheet. So once we've done our first step, certainly we're still going to have this pre-mask in place after we've done the first hit. So depending on the um, product that you're using, you may have a hot peel. In other words, you peel the heat transfer mask away right away, or you may have a cool peel depends on the product. The reason for that is this, this adhesive on the back of this heat transfer 
it'll liquefy uh, when it's heated and it needs some time to bond with the substrate before you pull it off. So if you're, if you're actually pulling your mask away and you know, the heat transfer is coming up too, it's probably because you haven't given it enough time to cool off. So just check that for the, uh, check your tech sheet for the correct instructions and follow along accordingly. Finally, after you've pulled the mask off, there's usually a second hit. So you're going to cover this again with uh, craft paper uh, or a Teflon sheet. In most cases for heat transfers, I usually use craft paper. Um, and then you're going to do your, your final application. So again, with uh, heat transfer products, we get into apparel and promotional items. You know, again, bags, hats, tees, golf shirts, umbrellas, sweats, tents, awnings, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of options just with the heat transfer side of things. So the next logical question is, well, what else can I make? Um, and certainly that's when the BN20 sort of gets a little bit interesting for a lot of our apparel people. Um, some of the other items that you can make include, you know, some simple vehicle graphics, um, point of purchase displays, floor graphics, even banners, window graphics, posters, and, and, and decals are all very popular. And we certainly have a lot of material options available for the Roland BN20. All of these materials that you see right here are all available in 20-inch rolls uh, specifically for the BN20. So we have the clear vinyl, poster papers, I mean, I'm not going to take you through them all, but window graphics, canvas, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of different ways um, for you to make, make some money utilizing this equipment. So we've kind of taken a look at all the different things that we can do with the BN20. I wanted to take a few minutes very quickly and talk a little bit about return on investment. The, 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 the uh, MSRP on a Roland BN20 is uh, about $8,500. So we want to take a look at, well, what do we have to do um, to bring back that investment? So in this example, We've, we're taking a look at hoodies, jerseys, and t-shirts to determine sort of how much money we can make doing short-run apparel. And short-run apparel is really great for a lot of screen printers and embroiderers that have in the past have kind of had to turn people away that want, you know, 10 t-shirts. I just want 10 t-shirts. Well, you know, it's about $20 for every screen that we're going to set up, and the guy wants four colors. You know, you're at $80 before you've even made a shirt. And Embroidery is, you know, there's some costs obviously associated that with that. We have to digitize our, our artwork and, and, you know, so on and so forth. So that's really where a unit like this can come in handy. It can allow you to um, not have to turn that work away and keep that customer in your shop, which is the most critical thing. You start turning that customer away, there's an opportunity that he's going to go to somebody that has this equipment and find out there may be other things that can be done for them. So, you know, it's really about keeping that customer uh, in your own uh, place of business and being able to have that option. So uh, I hope you can all kind of see this, but we, we've taken a look at uh, hoodies, jerseys, t-shirts, warm-ups, and bags. Um, we're using Roland's. This is a Roland heat transfer material here. It's called HTM2. It's great for cotton and poly. We sell this, it's, and it's very simple to use. It comes with its own poly mask as well. So we've taken a look at a graphic size uh, Actually, I'll use the T-shirt as an example. They're all they're all good examples, but since this this math is specific to the T-shirt, we'll look at that. So we we're, we're talking about a blank T-shirt for about two dollars, and a logo that's six inches by four and a half uh, inches. If we were to sell that T-shirt completed for eleven dollars, we can produce thirty T-shirts per hour using the BN20, which is an hourly profit of two hundred and forty-eight dollars. So this math is based on running your BN20 for one hour a day, making 30 t-shirts a day, five days a week for four weeks. So we're looking at a net profit of, of just over $5,000 for, uh, for the month with one hour of printing. And this is only textile. So we haven't even touched on the simple signage stuff that we can do. Um, so I, I think that's a pretty powerful, a pretty powerful slide. Um, you know, as I said, retails about $8,500. So you can pay, pay these one, one of these off quite quickly, or if you're looking at leasing, which is a great way to do it. Um, you know, why tie up capital uh, that you might need to order supplies or run your business with when you can lease? And you know, if you can't make sell enough T-shirts to make that lease payment, uh, you know, I think you can do that in a month quite easily. Now, regards to pricing, I was uh, um, taking a look at at this topic, and um, it, it's a complex complex topic. I wanted to look at. Um, I'll give you some basic suggestions and recommendations when, when pricing out signage 
first. The reason why I wanted to do this is because uh, for a lot of our customers who are who are you know, getting a VN20 or a VS300 or some other large format inkjet or 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 uh, Versa Studio, um, they've never done this side of the business and they're not really sure what to do uh, in terms of how to price it out. So the first thing you need to do already if you haven't, and I imagine that most of you probably have, is, is establish what your stop rate is. So again, I'm, I'm not an accountant and I don't, I don't profess to be one, but I'm just trying to give you some general advice. I'm sure we could do, you know, there's entire books uh, written on this subject. So I just want to give you some quick pointers that, that hopefully may be, may be benefit, beneficial for you. Um, so, you know, obviously your shop rate, once established, is going to give you an idea of how much you need to make each hour to cover your overhead, or your overhead. so you know, your taxes, your employee salaries, insurance, um, all of these kinds of things are factored into your shop rate. And once you know what that is, um, then you'll need to include that into the time it takes you to complete the jobs. So it's a little bit like when you take your car to the mechanic. Um, you know, they might know that it takes one hour to change the alternator on a Ford 150 and their shop rate is $100. So you're going to pay that $100 to have that part changed. Plus you're going to pay, you know, a markup on, on the part itself um, and the labor. So th this is kind of the same concept that we're using here, except now we're, we're talking about creating artwork, we're talking about printing and finishing time. So the other thing that you want to do is kind of get a, an idea of what your competitors are charging for their work. Um, a lot of um, shop owners are, are, are great at, you know, making signs, are great at, you know, making promotional apparel and, and great at doing artwork and great at some of those things, but they may be so kind of hungry for work that they're willing to work for less than the guy down the road. And I don't think that that's always the best um, methodology. Um, certainly you want to be fair and you want to price things out based on, on your market and the kind of product that you're, that you're offering. And if you can, if, if you're too inexpensive, you know, you're sort of devaluing the, the industry and devaluing the, the work. You know, folks get a printer and put it in their basement and figure they can be less expensive than the next guy because they want a competitive advantage. But your, your time and money is worth something and you should charge appropriately for it. If you can, if you know some other local businesses, um, and, you're, and you're friendly with them, you know, try to get together and establish similar rates. There is a lot of business out there. There's so many different things that you can do with this type of equipment that you may even be able to find a niche that no one else is really doing. Um, so, you know, there, and, and that will help you, allow you to, you know, make sure that you're getting a healthy margin um, on your work. Uh, and I say no, I also say no one to say no. Um, you know, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's just not worth the, the discounts that you're trying to give away in order to get the job and you may find yourself doing a low paying job when someone else calls you and offers you something that maybe is a little bit better but you're tied up with a lower paying uh, uh, job. So I think if you establish yourself as a high quality shop with great service, I think you'll be plenty busy and, and you know the rest of it will sort of take care of itself. When you're setting your pricing, I think you need to get an idea of how long it will take to do the job. And that's really the purpose of this slide. I know it's a bit busy, but this is actually the job log from Rolling VersaWorks. And I'm pointing this out because uh, this is data that's collected by VersaWorks as it does print jobs. So, and it's critical data that you can use to help get an idea of what your costs are and what you should be charging. Um, you know, we know the print area in inches, so we can very quickly and easily calculate our square footage which when we're printing signage, I should point out when we're printing signage, we, we speak in square feet. And when we do uh, textile or heat transfer products in heat printing, we talk about per square inch. And that's because we just don't want to do that, divide everything by 144 to get it into square feet. Um, we also have our ink consumption. So we know exactly how many cc's of ink was used to print this job. And if you dive into one of these, I can't do that here, but if I was to double click on this, it'll even show you how many cc's of each color you use. So you can very quickly calculate, you know, you know you paid X number of dollars for an ink cartridge and there's so many CCs in a cartridge, you know what your cost per CC is. And we even have a start and an end time for our printing. And all of this can be exported into Excel. So if you're like me, you can fire this stuff out into Excel and do some quick calculations and kind of very quickly know and get familiar with what it's going to cost you to, uh, to do your jobs. And then from there, it's just a matter of, you know, how long your, your time, what your shop rate is, and uh, what your markup what you want your markup to be on the materials that you're using, and you can make sure that you're working profitably. So the job log is really, really critical, and uh, it's a very powerful piece of information that 
unfortunately not a lot of people use, um, but, uh, but I myself uh, tend to take advantage of it. And after you've done it for a little while, you're going to know right away when I'm printing on this material, my cost is, you know, 55 cents a square foot or my cost is, you know, 75 cents a square foot. And, and you'll, you'll be able to establish those prices very quickly and, and very simply. Um, so, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier that, you know, we, we could very easily do a whole presentation just on the subject, but I just thought I'd impart a few points that hopefully uh, are beneficial to you and uh, I hope I'm not uh, wasting anyone's time there. So that's kind of a look at the signage side of things um, quickly. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about heat transfer pricing as well. I think the simplest way um, to look at this is, you know, we, we're a wholesaler and we make cat prints, so we're making a lot of these things wholesale anyway. Um, so obviously you're selling to the end user, so if you were to purchase these products from us, you're going to need some kind of a markup on the product, plus you're going to need some kind of a, a charge for the heat application portion of this as well, because you need to be making your money on it as well. So uh, we, can, we can probably provide this, uh, this document to you, but basically what we've done is we've established our heat transfer pricing based on a per square inch price and then based on quantities. So if we're using express print, for example, and the customer has between 1 and 24 pieces and the logo is less than 20 inches in size, we charge 16 cents a square inch and then the pricing changes from there. So there's no reason why you couldn't formulate, um, formulate these numbers into your own calculations and then, you know, obviously add your markup because you're selling to the end user and you're doing the heat application por portion as well. I have a lot of customers who, uh, you know, every time they lower their heat press, it's a dollar. You know, that's kind of the standard rate that, that they use. Um, so, of course, ob obviously what you charge should be uh, certainly completely your own and, uh, and, and dictated by your market and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what you can, you can justify for it. Uh, I got a question here uh, from uh, how, how, we, how we got the job log. So the job log is actually contained within the Roll and VersaWorks software. That's where we get that from. I'll just go back to that slide really quickly and take a look. And hopefully I'm going to uh, be able to answer that question for you. Uh, Keith, just bear with me here. So this, this is the job log. So, so what's happening is every time we print something on our printer, and this is available with the BN20, um, we just go up to the top of the menu, we press view and job log, and boom, this, this whole thing pops up and it keeps everything in there, and we can export that as an Excel file. Um, does, that, does that answer your question appropriately, Keith? Uh, hopefully, hopefully it does. I'll, uh, I'll watch for your, uh, your chat there, and hopefully we got that answer for you. Okay, so sort of trucking along here. Bear with me for a moment, folks. Let me get back on track. So, um, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so, so again, that's the that's the overview on the uh, on the heat transfer pricing. And these prices they incorporate, you know, uh, some some uh, some cost for labor and material and wastage and so on and so forth. And we've kind of factored all that in there and sort of maybe it takes a little bit of the guesswork out of it for you. I know it's a lot of information. Um, I just want to do a quick a quick recap, and then we'll do a we'll do a Q and A. So, sorry here one second. So to recap, obviously we have uh, with the BN20 with different ink configuration options, including metallic metallic silver ink, and our white ink. Um, we have a new and improved image quality um, through the uh, Roland Intelligent Pass Control and through the brand new print head. Um, which is a which is a big deal, and again, not not offered by other manufacturers. Roland on support, which is our online production assistant that reminds us or lets us know when a job's done or that we need to we need to change an ink cartridge, and does that via text message and so forth. And I believe that I could be wrong, but I think that is exclusive to Roland. I'm not aware of any other manufacturers that are currently doing that, and I, I think that's a great feature if you're out in the front of your shop or you're going out to meet with a client. Um, it's really nice to get that text message that tells you the job printed okay and there's no issues. Um, we have print and cut in one integrated workflow, um, which is nice, very simple. We have an easy load media feed system on this unit as well. I, I should point that out. Some of you may be familiar with plotters and uh, some of the inkjet plotters that we have. Um, they uh, they will sometimes you'll find it difficult to track your media left and right. You know you may notice it's sped out a few feet and it walks to the left or walks to the right and gets out of those pinch rollers. This easy load media feed system that they have keeps the media straight for the whole roll while you're printing, which is a great feature as well. 
Um, no volant has ever been easier to use. And th this is a great point. What they've done with this uh, BN20 is, you may have seen some other printers, they have a control panel on the front. There's no control panel on the front of this. It's done through a software utility. So when you come in in the morning and you log onto your computer, the software utility will pop up and say, hey, it's time to clean me. And a window will, po will pop open and it'll show you literally every stage of the cleaning process. It'll say, do this. And then once you're done that, click here. And then you do the next step and you click here and it walks you through everything very simple and very easy and very intuitive to use. So if you've ever been intimidated about using this kind of equipment before, certainly the BN has done a lot to address that. As we mentioned, it's bundled with uh, Roland VersaWorks uh, and also something called um, RWorks, which is a, a very simple design uh, software. We'll, we can maybe touch on that in another webinar down the line. Um, and we have media solutions that support core applications. As I mentioned earlier, we have all this type of 20-inch media available for you know, artist canvas and decals and you know, vehicle graphics and heat transfers and so, so much more already available. And our standard uh, one-year warranty on the BN20 as well. And finally, um, it wouldn't be complete if there wasn't some form of a shameless plug here, so I have to do this. Uh, we have something called here at Stalls DMS in Canada, the, the business in a box. So what we've done is we've bundled the Roland BN20 with an 11 by 15 max heat press and a JM26 jet mounter laminator, all for under 10,000. And that comes with 10 yards of, it, of our express print heat transfer and 10 yards of the mask. You get ink, installation, training, everything for under $10,000. There's my shameless plug. <laughs> and that's business in a box. And that concludes our webinar for today. I want to thank everybody for uh, being patient with me and uh, letting me go through my first webinar. Hopefully it was informative, a lot of information to try to cover and, and make informative in a short time. So please uh, stay tuned. There will be a, a post-webinar blog, and I'm going to put in some useful web links for you, videos on uh, uh, maybe express print uh, heat transfers being applied, as well as the uh, role and verse works videos for you. So once again, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Lucas. I'm Jody. I've actually been sort of the person who's been um, emailing everybody behind the scenes. So I'm kind of Lucas's technician during this. And actually, Lucas, we do have a couple questions. Keith said he arrived late and was wondering if you, um, if maybe he missed the part about how well the white works without clogging. He's been having some troubles with clogging on some different machines. Okay. And if you could touch on that. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. Well, um, well, a couple of a couple of points, and 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 uh, Keith, I I talked early on about uh, the, the important nature of making sure that when we're choosing our ink set, we kind of understand what we're getting into. And I talked about the difference um, that is required in terms of artwork when using white ink and using silver metallic ink, and also that the for a lot of our customers who are making you know simply making heat transfers or decals, and they're taking their customer's logo and putting a cut line in it and outputting it, you know, for, for, for that purpose, that that original logo that you're getting from your customer is probably designed in CMYK anyway. And if that's the case, then CMYK is the best method for, uh, for that application. However, if you're using white ink and you're using silver metallic ink, you definitely do want to be using it. Uh, not using it can cause you some maintenance issues. And if you have uh, a, a VN or a VS or some model like that, Keith, that is giving you some issues, uh, make sure you get in touch with, if it's, if it's Canada or Imprintables Warehouse or whoever it is, get in touch with your dealer and, 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 and ask them about it. It could be uh, when, they, when Roland first launched these, uh, they have a, what's called a capping station in there. The capping station makes a, a seal with the print head. And um, just to keep a long story short, the, 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 the tubing that came off the capping station was just porous enough to allow a little bit of air to penetrate the hose and to begin to cause the ink uh, some issues. In some cases, it can be fixed simply by pouring some cleaning fluid into the cap top and letting it sit for a little while. In some cases, that will be enough to clear it out. Uh, if that's not the case, uh, they can move you to a new style cap top. They've changed the tubing on that. It's a poly tube now. It's completely airtight and it eliminates that problem. Um, there's a couple of other things that could have been the flushing adjustment on the capping station may not have been done when your dealer installed it. Uh, should have been, probably was, but that's one, one thing you can look for. Um, if, you're, if you're in Canada, you can call DMS at 800-521-5255. You will get that number. It's, again, it's 
5255. And we can talk offline about that and give you some pointers and tips on that, but it's a pretty simple fix. But the biggest thing is if you're using the wipe and you're using the towel, you should be printing it on a regular I hope that answers your question. Okay, and he, Keith would also like to know, um, he said he has a VersaCam 640, and he was wondering if he can use the software from the, Versa, from the VersaCam and then just use the BN20 as a standalone if their softwares are compatible. They, they completely are, Keith. The BN20 uh, runs on VersaWorks just like the VS640 does. It's, it's the same. In fact, uh, if I, let me just see if I can find the slide here. It would be a good one for you to see because it actually shows that you'll actually see your screen essentially the same way, but you're going to have uh, multiple printers in your slide, in your, in your view. So if you, if you can see this slide, I, you'll notice I have a BN20 over here and I have a VS300 over here. So we can actually run a combination of up to four Roland devices from one workstation using um, VersaWorks. And that could be a combination of large format inkjet printers or um, GX series cutters as well. So we can run a GX500, a GX24, a BN20, and a VS300 all from the same hmm. if you want. So if I wanted to... If I wanted to switch from here to my BN20, I would just click over here, which I can't do because this is just a, a slide, but I would just click on that tab and then that would be my BN20. And you can see here, this is my BN20 job log. So I have QA and QB, there's nothing in the job log here, but I do have one file in QA of my, my VS300 job. So yes, absolutely that is, you don't even need to, uh, to get new software, you already have it. But if you do purchase a BN20, you will get another disk with the latest version on it. Um, and then the next um, question is, is there some sort of, or excuse me, Lou wanted to know, is there a setting to prevent the BN20 from rolling down so much before starting to print? Mm, that's a great question, Lou. Unfortunately, there is not. The VN20 does have some limitations when compared to its bigger brothers, and like the VS, uh, the VS models, where we can set an origin. I don't believe I don't believe there is uh, a, a specific way to set an origin on the BN20. It's kind of just the nature of the beast. So when you're pricing out your jobs, you know, you, you, if you're if you're a carpenter and you use a 10 foot two by four to make a nine foot wall, you're still charging for that one foot of two by four that you threw away because you have to buy the whole two by four. So this is kind of the same line of thinking with that. If you move up to a, a VS model or an SPI model, something like that, you do get a little bit more um, control over those things. Part of the reason is that we really wanted to simplify this. You may see that uh, change in an upgraded uh, firmware at some point down the line. Um, you're not the first person who's asked me that question. Okay, so I think we've run out of time. Um, what I do have a couple more questions that we can answer in the post-webinar blog. Um, and I do apologize. I think I was having a side conversation while everybody was listening, so I do apologize for that. Sometimes I forget my mic is on and people come and talk to me. So, <laughs> Enjoy your <I'm> sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> whew, so um, at any rate, um, I don't know um, if you have the slide, if you wanted to tell him, Lucas, about our next webinar that we have coming, or I can. I actually don't have the slide, Jody. That's yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the slide, but I know everyone wants, everyone wants IW mugs now. Okay, I know. <laughs> well, the good news is, is that we do have Stephen from IW on the 26th next Tuesday, and he is from IW. Now, I don't know if he'll be giving you a mug, but he is presenting session two <laughs> on the Corel Draw. Um, we did start last, well, actually we started in January, this, and it's um, it's a 12-part series where he's going to take you from beginner, absolute basic Corel Draw, turn on, you know, the software to actual artwork creation by the end of the 12 sessions. So he's presenting session number two on Tuesday. And if you did register for that, when you go on the full schedule at greatgarmentgraphics.com, you will see a link in order to be able to view session one of the webinar. So, um, and, and I see Keith had just said to sign me up. Keith, if you go to greatgarmentgraphics.com and you sign up for our blog right on the home page, you'll definitely receive a, um, you know, all of our updates 
And I will actually sign you up because I do think that I have your information. So you'll receive an invitation shortly, shortly after. Um, and if you would, any of you would like to view any of our archive webinars or um, view our blog or see what our full schedule to see what else we have coming um, in the month of April, you can do all of that at greatgarmentgraphics.com. So that's all I have today. Yeah, and I'd just like to thank everybody uh, for attending. And uh, hopefully I'll get better at these as I go along, but we'll be doing more of them. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next one. You did fantastic, Lucas. And hopefully maybe I'll have an IW mug for everybody next time they come. <laughs> <laughs> so. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and have okay. a great day. Thank you.